Good morning, church. Good morning. Time to start our morning worship service. Uh, we open up with a verse of a song. Please sing with me if you can. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, I want to uh, introduce today a theme, exalting the character of Christ. As we go through our devotion today, and even as we move into uh, the fellowship component and in the edification component, which is what we, the word preached, uh, we want you to understand that everything that we do has, uh, it is focused upon lifting up the character of Christ. For Jesus said, if I be lifted up, right? I do what? I'll draw all men unto me, which helps us to understand that we will be uh, powerful agents of Christ as we lift up the character of Jesus. Yeah. And we lift up the character of Jesus through Christian living. Right. Hello? Yeah. Which gives a, a, a platform and a megaphone to the Christian message. Yeah. Okay? So let's keep that in mind as we go through this today, because we want to make sure that in all things, we're exalting the character of Christ. I want everyone to stand, if you will. I hope and trust that you already put your, uh, your, your electronic devices on silent, mute, or off, whatever you have to do to make sure that our worship will be unhindered by all of those interferences. Again, exalting the character of Christ. I'm going to begin, and you'll come in where it says assembly, and then Ultimately and eventually we all come in uh, together. Let us begin. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Teach us, O oh Lord, to follow your decrees. Then we will keep them until the end. All together now. One, One thing, thing that we ask of the Lord. Lord that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our lives, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to see him in his temple. Let's pray together. Dear God, we are grateful uh, to be able to come to you today. A new day, fresh, clean, and completely new, leaving behind all of the adversities and the heartaches of the past, uh, we are planting our feet on the solid rock, which is Christ Jesus, to give us a firm footing on our today. And dear God, as we pierce into the darkness, as we look and we begin to try to navigate our way through the future, help us to know that you are with us every step of the way. So today we don't fear what the adversary throws at us. Uh, we are not dismayed by all of the circumstances going on around us. We are not deterred, nor are we moved in any way uh, to let our feet slip from the foundation, which is Christ Jesus. So today we stand 
uh, we proclaim that, yes, we are to exalt your character. Yes. Help us to live and to move and to have our very being anchored in the Lord. Yes. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory. Yes. So therefore, as we worship you today, we are stating how much we need you. Yes. Uh, we are proclaiming our dependence on you. And we are also saying that we pledge today that we will be transformed by your word. Yes. We will be moved in a direction that is on the highway of holiness. Yes. We will begin to make our steps uh, regulated by your word, your will, and your guidance. Yes. So we ask your God that you just imbibe us with your spirit. Uh, give us an attitude uh, to say thank you, Lord, yes. for all that you are, yes. uh, for all that you do, yes. for all that you will do, for those and to those and through those who put their trust in you. Yes. For this is our prayer in the blessed name of Jesus. Let us all say amen. amen. Remain standing, please, as our devotional team comes and lead us in songs of inspiration. Amen. Let's go to page 346. In our sacred selections, page 346. If you have it, let us sing. Everybody ought to hold to his hand. Hold on to my God's unchanging Everybody ought to hold to his hand. Hold on to my God's unchanging hand. You ought to build your hopes of things eternal. Everybody ought to hold, hold to a God's unchanging Changing hand, well now time uh, uh, is filled with swift transition. Yes it is, yes it is. And uh, now uh, not a hundred the moon shall stand. Said, oh, you ought to build your hopes of things eternal. Everybody ought to hold on to God's unchanging. Everybody ought to hold, come on, hold on to my cotton, well, you better, you better, you better, you better hold to, hold on to my cotton, well, you ought to build your hopes of things eternal, everybody ought to hold, hold to cotton, all I now trust uh, in him who will not leave you. I know he won't, no he won't. I now steal whatever years may bring. Oh, oh now I give uh, by earthly friends for sake. I will I now steal, steal more closely to him. Everybody on a hold Come on at my God's will Now you better, you better, you better, you better hold Hold on, hold on to my God's heart Oh, everybody ought to yield Your hopes on things eternal Everybody ought to hold Hold to God's will Time now, I hold to his hold on to my kind. Well, everybody ought to hold on, hold on to his hold on to my kind. Oh, you ought to be your hopes on things eternal. Everybody ought to hold, hold to God's unchanging. Let us notice page 118 in our rare book, Shelter in the Time of a Storm. Shelter in the Time of Storm. Have it? Let us together sing. The Lord's a rock in Him we have, a shelter in the time of a storm. Secure whatever is betide. A shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, my, 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 my Lord, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I said a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I said a 
shelter in the time of a storm. A shade by day, defense by night. A shelter in the time of a storm. No fears alarm, no foes of pride. A shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, my, 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 my Lord, my Jesus is a rock and a weary land. I said a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock and a weary land. A shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, my, 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 my Lord, my Jesus is a rock and a weary land. I said a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock and a weary land. A shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, rock a divine, oh, refuge deep. A shelter in the time of a storm. Thou art helper of heaven need a shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, my, 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 my Lord, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I said a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I said shelter in the time of a storm. Oh, my, 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 my Lord, my Jesus is a rock in a weary land. I said, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of a storm. Amen. As we prepare our hearts and our minds for communion, let us know this beautiful Lamb of God. Beautiful Lamb of God. Let us together sing. Beautiful Lamb of God, guiltless and pure as snow. Sent from the throne above, sent to redeem us with his blood. Oh, beautiful Lamb of God, guiltless and pure as snow. Gentle and merciful, beautiful Lamb of God, sent from the Father's love, sent from the throne above, sent to redeem. Good morning, church. Good morning. This brings into the portion of the sermon for recognize the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and symbolically take up his body and of his blood. We read in Acts 27, upon the first day of the week, disciples came together for the purpose of breaking bread. I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, first, verses 23 through verse 29, and it reads, For I was seed of the Lord, to which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. 
when you stop saying this cup is the New Testament my blood, this you do oft as you drink it and remember to me. For love you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, who shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, either drank a damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. <clears throat> Let's pray. A dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come thank you, Heavenly Father, for the bread that represents your broken body, Heavenly Father. We come thank you for the cup that represents the blood you shed for us, dear Lord. May we take time, Heavenly Father, to meditate and focus on the sacrifice you made for us, dear Lord. Because through those sacrifices, we have right to the tree of life. And we have life, and we have that life so much more abundantly. We're truly grateful for these blessings, dear Lord. Thank you so very much. Amen. Amen. When they Was everyone served? This now brings to the portion of the service where we're commanded to give. We're also referred to a book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, chapter 9, verse 6 and verse 7. But this I say, he with sword sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he who soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves the cheerful giver. <clears throat> Let's pray. Our dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank for this opportunity, Heavenly Father. We know everything belongs to you, Heavenly Father, but we thank for this opportunity to be able to give something back, Heavenly Father. And may this collection be used for the furtherment of your spiritual kingdom, Heavenly Father, in this community. And elsewhere, Heavenly Father, we're truly grateful for this opportunity to be able to give something back to the Lord. Thank you. Amen. And if you have a collection, a uh, contribution, hold up your envelope and the brothers will collect them from you. We're going to teach a new song today, one that we've been working on for a while. Now, y'all pray for me because I'm living in the weather today. Um, but the song that you see up there is called I Give Myself Away, right? The first part of that song um, is called withholding nothing. So this is what we're going to do today. Um, I'm going to go through withholding nothing once on my own so you can hear it. And then after that, my brothers behind me will sing with me and I'll put you on your parts. And then we'll transition until I give myself away, okay? So just pay attention to me. One of the things that we've been trying to do in our service is, you know, implement new songs. But also songs that are vertical. There's two ways we sing, horizontally, where we encourage and admonish one another, edify one another, but then also horizontally, where we are singing to God, to him. This is a horizontal song, okay? So let's start, amen? We'll get through this, amen? amen. I surrender all to you. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, 
withholding nothing. Brothers, I, I surrender all to you. I surrender all to you. Alto, let me surprise you here. Everything you hear that? Alto. I give to you. Here. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. This song talks about holding nothing away from God. Anything that you brought into this service today, give it over to the Lord. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Every care, every pain, every problem you have. Every secret you hold, give it over to God today. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Let's go back again. Well, I, I surrender to Every struggle, Lord. I'm withholding nothing, Lord. Holding nothing. Holding nothing. We're holding. I'm trusting you today, Lord. With hope. Holding nothing. With hope. With holding nothing. With holding nothing. With holding nothing. All right. Now we're going to move over. Okay. Self away, oh Lord, I give myself away so you, so you, so you can use me. I give myself away, I give myself, oh Lord, I give myself away so you. So you hold on. Oh, oh, I give myself away. Oh, hold oh, oh, on. I give myself away. So you. All right, here's the verse, okay? It says, Here I am. Here I am. Here I stand. Here I stand. Lord, my life. Lord, my life is in your hands, is in your hand. Lord, I'm longing, Lord, I'm lo longing to see, longing to see your desires, your deeds revealed in me, revealed in me. Oh, I give, I give myself away. Today. Give it all to God. Oh, oh Lord, oh, Lord. show you. So you. Are we going back? Okay. Use me and I surrender all. You hear it now? To you, everything, Lord, everything, thing, Lord, I give it to you. Withholding nothing, withholding 
nothing withholding, withholding nothing, withholding, withholding nothing, withholding nothing from you. I give my life to you, Lord. Praising your name, Jesus. I'm withholding, withholding nothing, withhold, withholding nothing, withholding, withholding nothing. Let us notice, I love my Savior too, page 262. Before scripture reading and prayer. If you haven't, let us together say it. Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to him I sing. Onward I go. Yes, closely to him I cling. Blessings still flow. For I love my Savior too. And don't you know that I love my Savior and he loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. And I see his favor in everything I do. Ooh. Yes, I'm walking with him each day. Love life does shine and I'm doing his will always never refine and I'm kneeling to him I pray thy will not mine for I love my Savior too and don't you know that I love my Savior and he loves me too yes he loves me too and I seek his favor in everything I do. Yes, I'm happy to serve my friend, lean on his arm, and the rapture will never end, nothing along. Yes, our voices will sweetly sing under his charm. For I love my Savior too. And don't you know that I love my Savior? And he loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. And I seek his Don't you know that I love my Savior and He loves me too. Yes, He loves me too. And I seek His favor in everything I do. Good morning, saints of God. Our scripture text will be taken from Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20, King James Version. And there was a famine in the land. Stand. There was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to, into Egypt to sojourn there. For the fam famine, famine was grievous in the land. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art 
a fair woman to look upon. Therefore, I shall come, it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians saw, they, when the Egyptians shall see thee, that they shall say, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they shall save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptian beheld the woman that she was very fair. The prince also of Pharaoh saw her and commanded her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken unto Pharaoh's house. And he entered and treated Abram well for her sake. And he, shall, he had sheep and ox, asses and males, men servant, maid servant, she asses and camels. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this thou hast done unto me? Why did thou not tell me that she is thy wife? Why saith thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, behold thy wife. Take her and go thy way. And Pharaoh commanded the men concerning her, concerning him. And they sent him away and his wife and all that he had. That's complete the reading. May God add his blessing to the reading, the hearing, and those who obey and do God's word. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, God, I just want to just stop and say good morning, Lord, and to thank you for opening our eyes to see another day, a day that we can worship and, and praise you, Lord. So, Lord, it is good for us to be here in the house of the Lord. We pray that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable to you because you are truly worthy to be worshiped. Be with our minister, your servant, as he brings unto us the wonderful words of life. Be with our sick and shut in, Father. Comfort, heal them that they can be with us very soon. Bless each of us, Father, as we worship you both in spirit and in truth. We thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and, and ask for strength in the times of temptation that we can overcome Satan and his evil deeds. Praying, Father, for the leaders of our country and of the world, Father, that they will do things that are pleasing, acceptable in your sight. Help us, Father, to make the right decisions in our lives, that we may be pleasing unto you, Father. Now be with us as we go through the service, that everything will be done decency and in order, that you might receive the glory. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice page 396 in our red book, 396. Camping Towards Canaan's Land. Children's Church can also be dismissed, too. Children's Church may now be dismissed. All students and teachers, please make your way to the classroom. Let us together say. I will lead this land of bondage with this earthly treasure and I'll journey to a place where there is love on every hand. 
And I'll exchange a land of heartache for a land of pleasure. For I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy every day. I'm, every day I'm, I'm camping toward a land of Canaan. And with rapture I survey his wonders, beauty grand. Glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise. For I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. And out of Egypt I will travel through the darkness dreary and far over hills and valleys and across the desert sand. But I will end up safe at home where I shall not grow weary for I'm camping. I'm camping towards Canaan's happy and every day, I'm, every day I'm, I'm camping toward the land of Canaan. And with rapture I survey his wonders, beauty grand. Glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise. I'm camping, I'm camping. Towards Canaan's happy land. And uh, yes, I reached that land of promise with the scenes of glory. My journey ending in a place so lovely and so grand. And I'll be led by Jesus to that blessed land of story. For I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy and every day. Every day I'm, I'm camping toward the land of Canaan. And with rapture I survey his wonders, beauty grand. Glory, hallelujah, I will find the land of promise. For I'm camping, I'm camping towards Canaan's happy land. Page four. Hundred and three. No tears in heaven. I believe that. And if you do, let us together sing. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given. All will be glory in that land. There'll be no sadness. All will be gladness. When we shall join that happy band, and there'll be no tears in heaven, there'll be no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown, and there'll be no tears in heaven, there are no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. Yes, glory is waiting, waiting up yonder where we shall spend an endless day yes there with our savior will be forever where no more sorrows can dismay and there'll be no tears in heaven there are no tears no tears up there sorrow and pain will all have flown and there'll be no tears in heaven. There are no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. And there'll be no tears in heaven. There are no tears, no tears up there. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. And there'll be no tears in heaven. There are no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be no Amen. We're thankful to Almighty God for this day, allowing us to be here yet another day uh, to engage in the one anothering process. How do you like that? The one anothering process when we come here and we show love. Uh, one to another, and we encourage uh, one another. Right. We're here to build up one another, even as we uh, uh, support 
one another, as we uh, encourage one another, and even admonish um, one another. Sometimes we have to rebuke one another. Is that right? But it's all good because it's for the perfecting of the saints. And so we have converged on this place, on this day, to not only worship God, but as we worship God, we are ministering to who? One another. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Uh, I apologize for the uh, typo on the screen. Uh, turn to Genesis chapter 12. Uh -huh, Genesis chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at verses 10 through 20. Once again, that's Genesis, the 12th chapter. Uh, verses 10 through and including uh, verse number 20. Let me just go ahead and say that we appreciate all of you who are here today. And even those who may be tuning in virtually, uh, we want to express uh, our profound gratitude uh, for you as we express our love for God. We know that uh, his people presence makes all the difference in the world. Do you not know if you possess the spirit of Christ uh, and we all come together, um, we are able to uh, harmonize and minister to one another in a way that the world can never do. Amen. And so it is here that we come together uh, and we collectively uh, combine all of our individual experiences. If God has blessed you and God has uh, providentially got you through this week into this new moment, we ought to say praise God. Amen. And then if we say praise God together, we well up into a crescendo yes. of thanksgiving Amen. unto God. Glory be to his name. Yes. Now notice, yes. notice uh, in this passage, we are taking for a subject uh, the casualties of carnality. Amen. The casualties of carnality. And the reason why that is important, because number one, we have to understand that salvation is positional. Right. But Brother Meriwether, what do you mean by that? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter and verse number 17, for if any man be where? Yeah. In Christ, he is a new cre creation or a new creature, depending on what version you have. But the bottom line is, is if you are in Christ, that's positional. Not talking about how good you think you are. It's about where you are, whose you are. So if anyone is positioned in Christ, he is a new creation. He is the recipient of all spiritual blessings. And so therefore, it is our pilgrimage. Once you're in Christ, hallelujah, praise God. But now once you are in Christ, we have to now walk in Christ. And so therefore, it is our pilgrimage uh, it's in that pilgrimage that we uh, develop the disposition of Christ. That is the character of Christ, right? That is the, the behavior and the mindset of Jesus, okay? So your position ought to give way to the cultivation of your disposition. The disposition don't save you. But once you save, it'll teach you how to walk right, talk right, sing right, pray right. Right? While you're on the battlefield. And so therefore, we have to understand the, the sequential order of this thing. First, we got to be in Christ. And then act like it. That's all it's saying, right? And, and so notice, notice uh, worldly attitudes can have spiritual consequences. Okay? Worldly, see, sometimes you can come in Christ, but you still have to now uh, put to death those old habits, right. those old values, those old mode of operandi, the way in which you used to carry yourself, all of that has to go through a purging process. It has to go through a process of, 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 of clearing the lot so that you can plant a beautiful garden. And so the purpose of this lesson is simply to show that uh, through the vicissitudes uh, of life, and in other words, life is not a straight line. Life 
consists of ebbs and flows, right? Twists and turns, ups and downs, you know, winding and, 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 and traversing through this life is going to cause some bumps in the road. Yeah, yeah. So as we go through the, the fluctuations and the changes of life, uh, God is using those experiences. He's using those circumstances uh, to uh, shape us into his desired masterpiece. You see, it reminds me of uh, the great Michael or Michelangelo, who uh, was a great uh, sculptor. And he saw this block of marble, and he looked at it, and he looked at it, and then he said, quick, hand me my, my chisel and hand me my, uh, my, my, my hammer. There's an angel trapped in this marble, and I must release it. In other words, he was able to see that. And as a sculptor, he began to see that he was going to sculpt this beautiful statue. It wasn't there yet, but in his mind, eye, in his faith, he saw it there. Yeah. What are we able to see? Do we see God doing some great things in our lives? Do we see God accomplishing great things even in the life of the church? We must, with the spirit of Michelangelo, release that which is captured within us. And so today we ought to see ourselves as God's masterpiece. But now we must uh, submit ourselves to the chiseling process. Uh, Jeremiah would talk about going down to the potter's house. And he observed the potter. He saw that uh, there was a lump of clay that was put on this wheel. The wheel represents life itself. And as this clay is placed on the wheel and the wheel begins to spin and then the potter begins to manipulate uh, the clay, the clay can be saying, ouch, ooh, that don't hurt, that hurts. Leave me alone. I don't, I don't want to be no vessel. <coughs> but at the end of the day, it becomes a vessel of honor or dishonor yeah. based on the quality of that clay. Yeah. And, and so today I want us to uh, I want us to remember that God has brought us here for the purposes that are far beyond any and everything that we could think or imagine. Amen. See, sometimes we can only look at our lives in a static kind of way. We see where we are right now and right here. But do you not know that God has a vision for you that far exceeds your expectations? God has a plan for your life uh, that is bigger and more grander and more nobler than anything that we could imagine. Only problem is sometimes we can't see what God wants us to see, right? right? And we get so caught up in our own uh, carnality that we cut off uh, the blessings and the providential destiny that God has in store for us. Oh, what a tragedy it is for us to live so far beneath our privileges that we are never really transformed uh, and therefore not used as God's ultimate agents of change. Do you not know that if you want to be God's change agents, you have to first become changed before you can affect change in somebody else? Hello? The Bible says, do not conform to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That, tra see, that transformation process can be a grueling process. It can be a daunting process. Why? Because it brings you face to face with your own inadequacies. It brings you face to face with your own frailties and shortcomings. And sometimes we don't want people to see that we're not all there. That's right. We don't want to see people to see us not having all things together. And therefore we hide and camouflage and cloak the truth. But eventually God uses his providential circumstance to reveal to you, to expose you to you. <laughs> well, I want to select as a theme uh, that goes along with this title, The Casualties of Carnality. Uh, I want to say the testing and refining of your faith. We all have faith. Hello? But you see, your faith is not uh, what God wants it to be until it goes through uh, the refining fire. Until it goes through the purging process. Before it is tested and challenged, you can't say your faith is authentic. 
Okay, let's go to the text. When it gets quiet like that, I say, okay, it's time to go into the text. Because I want to I wanna show some, the context of this, we, we talked about this on last week. Uh, but the context is simply this. Before Abraham could be called the father of the faithful, uh, God has to expose Abram, okay? He has to be exposed and confronted with his own carnality. With his own carnality. See, uh, even though he was called mm -hmm. from Ere of the Chaldeans, and he went up to Haran, and then he began this pilgrimage, the call in and of itself uh, was not the end of the process. Right. That was just the beginning. When you become a Christian, know you not that it's not the end, but it's just the beginning of a journey. So it is the beginning of a, a pilgrimage. Uh, that prepares you for a greater destination. Yeah. Notice, uh, like all of us on the Christian pilgrimage, Abram had to be purged by the providential fires of God. Now, so on last week we said that uh, he resided in Ur of the Chaldeans, uh, and he went up to Haran. But we also said on this journey, it was a journey to greatness. And God made some promises to him. God made these promises. You know, I'm going to make you a great nation. Right? right? right. He said, I am going to bless you. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, and I am going to uh, uh, bless you to such a degree that those around you will be blessed. He says, um, those who bless you, I'll bless them. Those who curse you, I'll curse them. He went on to say, I am going to make your name great. And then he says, and through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, wait a minute. Great, 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 great. I'm wondering what's going on in Abram's mind. Uh, the prospect of all this greatness. Perhaps he thought about it from a materialistic standpoint. Sure. I'm going to have great lands. I'm going to have great wealth. I'm going to have great influence. I'm going to have a great posterity. I'm going to have greatness. And every time people would come to me as a sultan of greatness, and I would bestow blessings on folk and, and all that kind of stuff, right? What's going on in his mind? Well, He says, uh, I need you to leave this place. Now, when I say leave this place, let's not get it twisted. Uh, initially, in this text, uh, it was a physical place, right. Right? right? But sometimes God, when he asks you to leave a place, he may be uh, talking about your state of mind. Right. He may be talking about the relationships that you find yourself in, right. certain encumbrances that you have certain things that have kept you stuck and you can't walk by faith because you're so trapped in walking by sight that you can't see. So he said, I want you to move from this place. And today we're going to see him moving from that place, but really he had to move from this place in his head. The, the greatest distance uh, that anyone can travel is the six inches between this ear and that ear. <coughs> That's right. That's right. And, and so therefore, the occasion, uh, the first occasion of Abraham's uh, carnality is manifested through five things. Number one, it is manifested through the famine. You see that? It's manifested through this great famine that came along. Secondly, it's going to be manifested in the great falsehood on the part of Abraham as he lied uh, to Pharaoh. The, th the third is through the favor that he received as a result of his manipulation. And then number four, we see the frustration of those around him because of the lie. There were certain manifestations that were harmful and detrimental to others based on his lie. There was great frustration. And then it translated into the great fury. I'm going to touch on all those things as we get started right now. Let's begin with the famine. And open your Bibles, and we're going to look at Genesis once again, chapter 12, 
and we're going to look at verse 10 uh, for just a moment. Notice what the Bible says there. It says, And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Now, I want to stop there because it says that Abel, Abram goes from Canaan to Egypt to escape a harsh famine in that land. Underline the idea in the land or in that land. Because there was uh, a famine in Canaan, we note that there was no famine in Egypt. I'm assuming that there was not a famine back home. Are y'all with me? So he goes into Egypt. Can you imagine Abram for just a moment? Abram, who is stricken by this great famine in the land where God said go. And he begins to go back uh, to his time in Mesopotamia, in Ur. Uh, a land that is irrigated by the great Euphrates River. Uh, it is a land that is plush and plentiful. He has everything that he wants. And he was there in that plush and fruitful land, and God began to talk to him, saying, leave. What do you mean, leave here? Leave this? I mean, leave Edwardsville? <laughs> he says, I want you to leave here. And he began to incentivize by saying, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to make your, your, your posterity great. Everything great, great, great. And now here he is. He's looking at the land, and the ground is so dry, he sees big cracks uh, in the ground because of no rain. He able to, he's able to see all the erosion. He's watching his cattle, which at one point was plentiful, beginning to dwindle. Uh, not only is he losing livestock, but the livestock he has is uh, becoming more and more gaunt or more and more malnourished. And he sees all of these things taking place, and he begins to reflect on how good things were. And now that I've come to this promised land, as a matter of fact, years later, um, this land is going to be described by Moses and them as a land flowing with milk and honey, right? There ain't no milk and honey flowing right now. <laughs> these... Uh, circumstances caused him to remember the bountiful land of his nativity. See, these circumstances served uh, as perhaps it was a punishment on the inhabitants of that city. We don't know. We understand that they were a wicked city, quote unquote. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but not only that, sometimes the things that are going on in your life and you may look at them as adversities and calamities and all those kind of things, but notice Perhaps, perhaps God is using those things as a test of your faith. Notice he has an option here. He's here, and he knows uh, there is, if he goes south, he's going to go to Egypt. But he can also go back home. Okay? Yeah, he may go and have to face some ridicule from, from his homies and all that kind of stuff for a moment. But it may be worth it to go back to that place of comfort, ease, and familiarity. But therefore, you then forfeit all the promises of God. Yes, and so therefore, it's a test of his faith. He, I, yes, I left the fertile surroundings of my homeland. I, I'm now confronted with a severe famine in the midst of a strange land. <coughs> do I return home? Or do I continue to journey? Or do I stay just where I am? Mm. Mm. Well, uh, the condition or the conclusion to go into Egypt could, in the mind of some, um, suggest a journey of faith. See, if God puts you in a place, he wants you to now uh, look through faith and see resources that God has put in front of you. Perhaps Egypt has been uh, a place of God's blessing. You know, this is not the first time folk had to go to Egypt. Remember Israel or Jacob? See the parallel between the two? Both were dealing with a famine. Both had to go uh, to Egypt. Egypt became, for both of them, a place of ultimate bondage, right? Uh, 
both of them had to deal with a pharaoh that was stricken by a plague, right? Both of them had to deal with uh, a, a, a pharaoh who, because of that plague, received injury and hurt. We're dealing with a, uh, a, a group who, when he came out of uh, that place, he was able to leave with, both of them were able to leave with the spoils of their land. Right. And when both of them left, where'd they go? To Canaan. Okay? But the point I want to make here is right it here. Faith to see Egypt as a source of God's provision is plausible. Faith uh, to consider the full import of God's promise. See, this is something I want to share with you. See, when he got that promise, I'm going to be great. I'm going to be great to everybody and everybody who knows me going to get great bestowed upon them and all that kind of stuff. He was looking at it perhaps materially. But now, as he goes through these purging processes, it begins to cause him uh, to rethink um, this whole call. Maybe it's not for me just to be great and boast in my greatness and glory in the fact that everybody sees that I'm great, perhaps uh, is to become an agent of God to bless all nations. Perhaps your life is not all about the ease and comfort that you can uh, eke out of living. It may be that God has uniquely positioned you here to be a blessing to others. Do you not know that through this whole process, Abraham becomes the father of the faithful. He also is the one through his lineage comes the Christ. Right. And it's through Christ that all nations will be blessed. Oh, this promise was not just for you in the immediate sense. It was uh, to you in terms of historically certain things are going to happen through what I'm going to do with you right now. Do you not know that God can be working with you right now, moving you right now, putting you in a position right now for you to be a blessing uh, to some folk uh, three generations down. You've been dead a long time. And they are still being blessed because you chose to walk with God. Because you uh, showed fidelity to God. And you were unwavering in your commitment to give yourself full-throatedly to God's agenda. And now you're going off the scene and other folk are now being blessed by you. Wow. Abraham had to oh, rethink this thing. It's not all about your immediate needs. It's about what God has in store for you and through you. So therefore, notice uh, the consideration and the duration of his time in Egypt shows a commitment to God's promises. I want to show you this again. Look at, look at the text again. It, it says... Um, He went down into Egypt to sojourn, to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. In other words, he did not go there to stay. He was simply sojourning. He was, we sing the song, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Uh-huh. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. He said, the heaven, the angels beckoned me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this place anymore. You're just sojourning on this time side of life. This is not the end run right here. You're just going through this right now, but our citizenship, last time I checked, was in heaven. And if your citizenship is in heaven, you're just sojourning right now. He said, they even went to sojourn in Egypt. I'm not here to stay. I'm here to pass on through. And God wants you to understand, don't get too caught up and so attached to this world right. and claim that you want heaven to be your home. Right. Through providence, for a time, God may cast us into bad places. Yeah. Yet we may sojourn or pass, but not settle there. See, it's been said that a good man, while he is on this side of heaven, uh, he is... Uh, but a sojourner. Yeah, we are sojourners. And so we have to understand that while you're in this temporary place, you must conduct yourself as you are a citizen of heaven. Hey. Notice the second thing I want to share with you. In verse 13 through uh, 11 through 13, I want to talk about the falsehood. I'm talking about the casualties of carnality. 
the casualties of carnality. In verse 11 through 13, it's interesting what we see uh, on the part of the father of the faithful. Okay? Notice it says, And it came to pass, when he was come near to enter into Egypt, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, that he said unto Sarai, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Okay? Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Egyptians shall see, shall see thee, they shall say, this is his wife, and they shall kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, now watch this now, say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. I want you to digest that for just a moment. We're going we're gonna to deal with this, brother. Okay? Y'all got it? This is the falsehood. See, a great fault which Abram was guilty of in denying his wife and pretending, in the land of word pretending, that she was his sister. Uh, see, the scriptures are impartial when it comes to uh, relating the misdeeds of those who are celebrated as being great saints. You know, the Bible does not hide and sweep under the rug some stuff. You know, we talk about David. He did all this dirt, but was a great guy. The Bible puts it all out there. And I'm glad because that means it's help for me. You don't have to hide. Notice the things, these things which are recorded are not for our imitation but for our warning, okay? Just because you read something don't mean you do something. All the things that, that, that he was guilty of doing was not for your imitation. It was for your admonition. <laughs> He's warning you. He's showing you the character flaws of this guy and how God had to go through, send him through a refiner's fire to purge him. Guess what? Just like he's doing with you. Amen. Hello, you know different. But God is highlighting that this guy has some issues. He has He can't blame carnality on the Egyptian. He brought it with him. He concocted this story. He, 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 the Bible says uh, that we who think we stand, be careful lest we what? Hello. Notice this idea, she is my sister versus she is my wife. As they neared the place, he began to say, this is what might, ha might happen, might happen. There's no certainty this is going to happen. They're going to see you, you fine, you look good. Now, either she was 65 or 75, you know, whatever. Um, but we have to also understand that all the diseases and all the stuff that contributes to our aging process wasn't even there back then, right? Um, she had no children and all that kind of stuff. So... Um, but that's not even the issue. Was she fine or was she, ah, forget all that. The bottom line is, uh, <laughs> the bottom line is she's a strange person going to a strange land. And of course there are different features and people want to be taking a second look because you're different. When you come into a new place, folk are checking you out and they notice you. And, and so notice, uh, she would draw the attention of the Egyptians. Uh, now, notice uh, in the book of Genesis, chapter 20, verses 12 through 13, okay, right there, there, uh, 12 through 13, we find that there would be some truth to that. For the Bible says that they were uh, brother and sister. They had the same daddy, but had a different mother, okay? But here's the issue. The issue is, and my wife and I, we kind of play this game a lot of times, right? So sometimes I may say she asked me a question. And I say something, I say, that's the truth. You said, but was your intention to deceive? <laughs> Sometimes you can tell the truth in such a way with the intentions of deceiving. Sure. His intentions uh, were to compromise his character, compromise his righteousness, and concoct his lie. Uh, he, 
Notice, uh, as Abram's sister, his life might be spared, might even be elevated. As husband, Abram might be in danger. But here's the issue. Abram placed Sarai in danger. Yeah, he had no regard for her. Husbands, I want you to make sure you take care of your woman. Don't put her in a compromising situation. Don't put her in a situation that is going to, uh, uh, don't even start nothing right. It's going to violate her. See, Abram put her in danger, having her chastity violated. Uh, she had been a faithful wife. And now, based on this situation, based on this lie, now uh, he's going to put her in his harem. Notice, notice what he does. Well, let me read it first. Um, he says, say that you are my sister, that it may be well with you. No, he didn't say that, did he? He said that it may be well with me, okay, for your sake. And my soul shall live because of you. Now, when that statement is made, and he takes, uh, she is taken to the Pharaoh, not only is her chastity violated, potentially, by the king of Egypt, but she's also in danger of becoming part of the harem of Pharaoh. But even if that's not bad enough, stay with me on this. She was in danger of undermining the very plan of God for Sarah. Sarai is getting ready to engage in some stuff that's going to have an impact on Sarah. This is important because Abram had bought into all the information about the promise, but now he is standing in the way of God's fulfilling that process. Sometimes you have to get out of your own way if you want to be blessed back up. He concocted this. He got in, in God's way. He said, God, I'm going to help you out. You, you, did, you didn't see that famine coming, did you, God? You didn't see I was going to have to go down to Egypt. And so I am taking matters in my own hands now, and I'm going to concoct this, this farce uh, and this scheme to lie to Pharaoh Lie to the people of Egypt so that I may fare well, and I'm a sir, then I'm a pimp. And I'm putting Sarah out there. And that may sound crude, Brother Mary, whether what I dare you say that. But what is he doing? Notice, uh, notice the contract of a marriage. The Pharaoh began to give him all kind of livestock. He began to give all kind of resources on account of Sarah. He's now benefiting uh, from this lie. And now he's cashing in on the fact that I want you to say that this is not, uh, uh, this is my sister and not my wife. In other words, go ahead and take her. How is this promise going to be fulfilled? How is the promise of God going to be fulfilled through this carnality and through this compromise? Be careful. When you begin to compromise yourself, there are great things that God wants to do through you and your family that he won't be able to do when we compromise ourselves. When we sell out for comfort, when we sell out for the immediate, and therefore forfeit future blessings, God wants to bless us. But right now, as we go through this testing, don't allow ourselves to cheapen ourselves. He said, I'm putting you out there, Sarah, that it may go well with me. You know, it's going to prevent uh, the promises of God being fulfilled. But in the immediate, uh, his intentions were what? To deceive. It was certain that no, you know, the Bible tells us there's no weapon that's fashioned against us. Shall prosper, right? It's been given us that God's promises will not fail, right? Yet Abram, watch this, meanly sacrificed his wife 
with a pitiful proposition for his own safety. This would never have occurred had he stayed where he was told to go. Remember I said we're going to come back to this? Earlier I said that going down to Egypt may be a way of recognizing, you know, God's providence, right? But notice, where did God send him? He sent him to Canaan, right? Perhaps he should have stayed put in Canaan so he could see God deliver in a mighty and magnificent way. But he traveled to Egypt. And therefore, he was confronted with an opportunity to show to take the high ground or the low ground, and he took the low ground. He introduced deception to the Egyptian, right? He should have stayed where God told him to stay, perhaps. Uh huh. He ought to have uh, stayed quietly in that position to which God had called him, leaving the Almighty God. To provide. Had he stayed where God wanted him to be, God would have brought blessings there. But all this can be deceiving because the next thing we see is number three, the favor. Notice verse 14 and 16. I'll go through this kind of quickly. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld of the woman that she was very fair. <coughs> the princes also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Hello? Into Pharaoh's house. Uh, and he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and asses uh, and manservant and maidservant and she asses and camels. All that favor based on a lie. All those provisions. See, Abram seemed to have fared pretty good for her sake. The Egyptians saw the woman was fair. The princess brought her to Pharaoh. Pharaoh blessed Abram uh, because of Sarah, those marriage tokens. But notice, those things that look good can also result in frustration. I want to now give you this point right here. I want you to get this. In verse 17, notice what the Bible says. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plague because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Ah, when it became, when it was revealed, uh, not only was he upset, but there was a plague. God plagued Pharaoh and his household for his plans to marry Sarah. Not only on him, but his whole house. We see this as a, see God is not going to, he may let you do what you're going to do, but you're not going to stop God from his will being done. God will get his will done even if he uses you or he goes through you. God's will will be done. So we see divine intervention. God stepped in. Yeah, you're not going to be able to touch her. As a matter of fact, uh, a plague came on Pharaoh, on his household. On all those who were around him, they began to suffer as a consequence of this plague. And it was revealed to Pharaoh that this is because you have this woman in your house who's not yours. As a matter of fact, that's Abram's wife. Well, what did we say my sister? Yeah, yeah, I get that, but he deceived you. And so, therefore, can you imagine the frustration, uh, the effect of this? led to the discovery. See, what you do in the dark is going to come to the light. Amen. You run around here ducking and dodging and hiding and sipping and sliding and all that kind of stuff. Do you not know that stuff's going to come to light? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I can tell you firsthand. Some stuff I try to conceal comes to the light. And stuff that you may have done a long time, it's still manifesting. And so in this particular context, we see that he was found out. Uh, he kept Pharaoh from sin. He kept Sarah from being violated. He kept uh, the promise alive in spite of Abram. In spite of Abram, he still says, I am still going to have my will done. And, and so this frustration uh, results in uh, a fury. And I'm going to read this last part and I'm going to give it to you. 
in verse 18, it says, And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why did thou not tell me that she was your wife? You see that? Uh, why did you not tell me it was your wife? Why sayest thou she is my sister? So I might have taken her to be my wife. Now therefore, behold, thy wife, take her and get up out of here. <laughs> Italics, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he ran up out of there. Yeah. Abram did not foresee all the consequences of his misleading. What is this you have done? Perhaps, because he, see, perhaps he would have taken her. He just said that, right? But Pharaoh, watch this. Pharaoh proved to be more noble and more honorable than Abram. You see that? You know, we're talking about, you know, down in the wicked Egypt. No, he came out of Arab the Chaldean. They were pagan too. He was still pagan. Now, God had spoke to him. So he is now aware that God is an almighty God. He is now aware of the fact that God uh, communicates to his people. He is aware that God is a covenant-keeping God. He is aware of a lot of things about God, but there are certain things he don't know yet about God. See, you learn about God more and more as you get closer and closer to God. Does that make sense? He knew of the power of God, but he didn't know of the integrity of God. He knew of, you know, the, the almighty omnipotence of God, but he didn't know God as a, a, a God of, uh, of, of integrity, a God of character. He didn't know all those aspects. He's still running around, you know, uh, being manipulative and all those kind of things. But you know, God is truth. And he's running around in lies. You know, God is the way, and he's taking all kinds of different ways to get to the promise. God is uh, steadfast, unmovable. He's solid like a rock. But now this guy is like shifting sand. He has some growing to do. Notice, even, he even made a path clear for Abram to take Sarah. He put Sarah on out there. When I used the word pimp earlier, that's what I'm saying. He put her on out there and got paid for doing it and position himself to keep on getting paid. And then he was rebuked. He was rebuked by the Pharaoh. He said, what in the world have you done? Why did you tell me this uh, uh, was your sister? Why did you tell me and come clean? Well, you know, my daddy, no, I don't want to hear all that. <laughs> your intentions were to deceive. You lied. You compromised your character. You compromised your veracity. All of that. And now, I want you to leave here. I want you to get up out of here. See, all carnality uh, uh, is going to eventually fail. That's right. Eventually, your sin will find you out. But notice, he lost his self-respect. Wherever you go for the rest of your life, you're going to remember the fact that you lost your self-respect. You see what I'm saying? That he got all these provisions. And sometimes we talk about, yeah, when they left Egypt, they left with all the spoils of Egypt. And when, when Abraham, when he left the Pharaoh, he left with a whole bunch of stuff. Abraham would gladly give all that stuff back. If he could take that back. For the rest of his life, he has to understand and live with the fact that he acted, you know, uh, in an unjust way. Not only did he lose his self-respect, but he was rebuked by the Pharaoh. Now, you have maybe uh, vaulted yourself as being under the protection of the Almighty God. But in this situation, you compromised your character. And finally, how did he feel about the fact that God was dishonored by this act. Now, as you were getting out of Dodge, or should I say, getting out of Egypt, <laughs> you can't turn around and say, well, Pharaoh, uh, before I leave, let me tell you about the almighty God that I serve. I don't want to hear it. Let me tell you about, you know, Jehovah. 
Let me tell you about, you know, uh, the saving power of Jesus. Let me tell you about, you know, I'm a member of the Lion Street Church. I don't want to hear that. You're a liar. You're a cheat. And if that's the guy you represent, I don't want any part. He would give it all back to change his story. He compromised himself. He compromised his integrity, but he compromised God. So as ambassadors for Christ, understanding that uh, there are casualties for your carnality. God has put us out there to be a light to the world. How bright does your light shine? He could never say anything to Pharaoh about his God. And sometimes we can cripple our own uh, integrity that we can't even witness to people about coming to church or coming to Christ or all that because we have compromised and showed ourselves to be unrighteous. But even, now watch this, even though Abraham made a dismal display of God's character, God was not through with him yet. You've gone through some things in your life. You've done some things. You, you, you've engaged in some practices and some attitudes and behavior, knowing that attitudes have consequences. Notwithstanding, God still loves you. And God still worked with Abram. Before he could really use Abram, he had to expose to Abram some of the issues that he had. God sometimes has to expose you to you. So you can stop fronting and stop playing like you got it all together. You need to come to Jesus. Well, I've been in the church a lot. You still need to come to Jesus. Because there are areas and issues in your life that are steeped in your own personal carnality. And he said, I got blessings for you, but you can't get them yet until I purge you of you. And I need to come clean and say, you know what, dear God? I realize that all I have is all I got, but what I got, I give it to you. We just sang that song, I give myself away. Give yourself to him. Wow. Yes, you're still undone. No, you're not there yet. You still got some work to do. But as you are pilgriming through this, as you are sojourning through this thing, understand you are not here to stay. You are here to pass on through. But while you are here, glorify God through living in integrity. I need to say, you know what? I want to repent of dead works. I want to repent of all that, and I want to get back in step with God, in harmony with the will of God. Because in doing that, God said, I open the floodgates of heaven and bless you. I'll bless you so it'll blow your mind all the blessings I have for you that you can't have right now as long as you're still steeped in your carnality. The refiner's fire is burning. Are you willing to submit yourself to God's purging process so this church, so your family and your life can be a beacon of light to others? If you're not a member of the body of Christ, God is beckoning you to leave that place where you are and come into this new space that I want to provide, I've provided for you. And that I'm going to show you the blessings I have in store for you. Now let's get about the business of getting back. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I want to repent of my sins. I confess his lordship by submitting to him in baptism for the forgiveness of my sins. And then let's walk on this road together. God has great things in store for you and this church. All we need to do is respond. Boom, boom.